about something called questions and answers. Okay? As we know, a question, well, what is a question? It, it's about something that you don't have the answer to. Like, if someone says to you, how much is two and one trillion eight hundred sixty-seven million five hundred forty-three billion blah, blah, blah. Well, I'd say, well, I don't know offhand, but if you wait an hour or two and give me a calculator, I'll get you the answer. So a question usually is about something that is unknown, or it's unknown to the person being asked. I might know the answer, like I'm the teacher, and I say, well, um, when did Christopher Columbus discover um, India? No, I mean, not India, the Americas. Someone says, well, I know that it may have been around 1492, but a class of children may say, I don't know. When? <laughs> Tell us. We weren't there. So, I, 1492, Columbus was commissioned to sail, I think, to the west and find India. Anyway, so that's questions, or all the questions that come up in what we call education. And when you're given tests on what you know, the test usually consists of questions. What's the answer to question, 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 question? Now an answer, that's the other side. An answer is to resolve the question. Say how much is two and two? It's four. End of problem. The problem was how much is two and two? The answer is four. No more problem. So questions and answers can be little ones or they can be enormous. Like someone says, well, what is life? That's a big question, right? A little question is, um, well, I keep coming back to it. How much is two and two? That's a little question. And you know, if it's two apples and two apples, the answer is four apples. What is life is a much, much bigger question. And um, it isn't always a question that um, we ask of ourselves or that gets answered in school. Religions take a shot at it. I can't honestly, absolutely say um, a religion can and does answer that question. Now, usually when we get the answer to a question, we want to be able to verify in some way that the question, that the answer is correct. So, two and two, well, if I have two apples and two apples, yep, one, two, three, four. That's easy. I was able to verify it. Now, if someone comes along and says, I have the answer to what is life, I can say, well, okay, I'll be happy to listen to your answer, but um, are you able to take that answer in such a way that it somehow can be shown to be correct, accurate, provable, understandable. Well, someone might say, no, it's too big a question for that. You just have to take my word for it. Sorry. Now that I'm not five years old anymore, I don't take your word for it. I may have then taken your word for it, but now I require, without saying you're wrong, but I require some evidence. It doesn't have to be scientific, but I have to know that there's some connection between the question and the answer. Now, I've mentioned this because in Scientology, some of the very biggest questions are not offered. Well, here's the answer to that question. Possibly because the answer can't be proven, pinned down, stated in such a way that it is, without question, true. Certain questions may be only answerable by a person. 
not an organization or a philosopher or anybody. It's easy to ask questions, but questions like, what is life? Well, if someone asks that of me, in a sense, they're, they're asking me to become thoughtful. They're asking me to become scientific. They're asking me to become a philosopher. They're asking me to become someone who is going to look deeply into the question and see what's available. Now, I'm gifted into saying now too often, so I won't say now. Now is the last time I'll say now, okay? I'll probably say it again, but I'm going to try not to. Socrates, who was a Greek philosopher, who lived about 2,500 years ago, roughly, in a place called Athens, in a country called Greece, somewhere in Europe. He came up with this idea, and believe me, it was an idea, not necessarily provable. He said that human beings consist of something that goes beyond just being a body, that human beings have have or really are something called a soul or a spirit, which is not material. It's not a physical object. It's, it isn't? Well, no, it isn't. It's something that's capable of being aware. It's capable of understanding. It's capable of thinking. It's capable of all kinds of things, but it's not something like a stone or a rock or a piece of wood or anything. In terms of that, it's nothing. It is no thing. Hmm. Well, I was always taught that I, I was a person, meaning a body, and that I had a soul. And that this soul or spirit was not me. It was something I had. I was really a kind of a fancy evolutionary product body called a human being. And I got this thing called a soul. And if I'm a good boy and I behave and I don't do things that are sinful or evil too many times and I'm forgiven enough, uh, then when I, the body, die, the soul that I have is going to go to a place called heaven. And there it will reside with other good souls. And um, what's become of me? Well, um, I'm laid to rest in the old days in a casket, and they dig a hole in the ground and put me into it, and then the worms and the bugs and all take over, and pretty soon there's a skeleton and there's a headstone that says, he lies here. No, I'm not lying there. <laughs> At least I hope not, because I don't like, I'm too claustrophobic to like being put in a coffin and stuck in the ground, have all that dirt on top of me. Then there's this stone that says, here lies Phil. Well, I like to think I'm not lying there, or if I was lying there, uh, I'm no longer. So, but this thing called the soul that I had is either in heaven, which is a good place, some say, or it, it went to a bad place where it's going to suffer for a long, long time. Maybe it gets out of the bad place and eventually goes to the good place. I don't know. Not being a soul, how would I know? But anyway, Socrates said, no, no, no. It isn't a question of having a soul. You are soul. Now, this is before Christianity. The Hebrews had some other ideas before that. Didn't talk much about soul, though. But Socrates was confirmed in the idea that there was such a thing as a spirit, and that that was the real you. And that that spirit, combined with this nice piece of meat, with a a brain mostly consisting of cholesterol, fat. That's why they call me fathead. <laughs> he was convinced that the soul, the spirit, and the body got together and
Between the two, they had certain relationships, one of them being called the mind. The mind. Sort of an interface between the experiences that the body has and the thing that is um, not a body. It's a no thing. It's aware, but it isn't aware in the way a body is aware. It's conscious. And then between the body and the soul is a kind of an interface composite of body and soul. Now, that's one description of what Socrates came up with, and later Hubbard, when he came up with this idea of Scientology, which is loosely defined as the study of knowledge, Greek word skio means knowledge, ology, study of, <coughs> call it any name you want. But anyway, um, Hubbard was a great admirer of Socrates, because Socrates, if you ever read uh, one of his star pupil, Plato was a, a pupil of Socrates, and since Socrates didn't do any writing, Plato did a lot of writing, and he explained how Socrates uh, went about attempting to prove or illustrate his ideas so that they weren't just, well, you say there's a soul. Uh, do you have any evidence of that? Well, Socrates, in his various dialogues and um, things that he did with groups and individuals, went out of his way to give evidence that there was such such a possibility. He didn't try to jam it down to anybody's throat. He just says it looks like there is such a thing as an immortal soul, spirit, or consciousness. And the other attribute of it that is going to really knock your socks off, Socrates said, is it knows everything. Everything that ever has been, is now, and ever will be. That's just a small description of its potential for knowing or understanding. Well, a lot of people are like, sounds good on chisel it on some stone tablets. I don't know if they had any paper then, but uh, you're going to have to do more than just say that. And so he set out to help people to find out if they really were that, and that they were capable of understanding and knowing things that did not seem humanly possible. So 2,500 years, roughly, later, Hubbard come along and said, you know, Socrates had a great idea there. Let's see if we can design some things that you can do with people that will give them a chance to find out for themselves whether they are a spirit, whether they have a spirit, whether they are just a material body, nothing wrong with that, whether they're a brain, a nervous system, uh, anything. Let them find out what they can find out for themselves. Not because Socrates says there's a spirit, not because L. Ron Hubbard says, yes, there is a spirit. No, no. We have to come across a way, a method, a methodology, a system of processes and procedures that a person can do, etc., etc., and from that find out for themselves what they are. And on that stone rests the whole idea of Scientology as a religion. If that ain't true, if that can't be shown, if that isn't something that actually can be discovered and found out by each person for themselves, not something we beat into them, not something we, you believe that or we cut your throat, you know, the old-fashioned approach to religion. No, no. Or you'll go to hell and burn forever if you don't believe that. Or you'll go to heaven if you do. Now, we're not a faith and belief system. We aren't a moral system either. We're not trying to preach right and wrong. We are trying to preach understanding. Because all the moral efforts to teach the human race, human beings, right and wrong, has been so little effective 
that our history is one of bloodshed and evil and torture and death and destruction from the very people that you would think would be preaching love, understanding, etc., etc. So, we aren't trying to be a moral philosophy and sit in judgment of who's good and who's bad, and if you're this good, you'll go there, and if you're that, no. All we're trying to do in Scientology, Dianetics is another subject we're going to come to next, but in Scientology, we are trying, and I use trying, to help an individual answer a question that they might have had from the time they were a little kid. What am I? What am I? Mommy and Daddy say this, and the teacher says that, and the rabbi, the priest, says this, and the book says that, and that. But what am I really? Some kids, really, at a most early age, are interested in, what am I? What are you? Not every child. but And then as they get older and reach puberty and other things are coming in, what are people? So that's the big, big thing, the big simplicity behind this whole big whatever you want to call it called Scientology and that came to be called a religion um, and I'll repeat again how that happened but it's still the fundamental question of all philosophy is to find out what we really are because that information if you get it will then answer so many questions that's one of those big questions see, that answers so many things about life and people and the history of the universe that if you can get that answer and it has to be workable, understandable, transmittable, you're going to be way ahead of the game, so to speak. And on that, with that last statement, I think I avoided saying the N-O-W word this time. We'll take a break. Thank you for listening.